over the years, Valve has earned this reputation as one of the more enigmatic companies in the video game industry. They just seem to play by their own set of rules, and in many ways they do. There are no managers, employees don't have official titles, and people are free to move from one project to another whenever they want, which is why all the desks have wheels. To an outside observer, this might seem like organized chaos. And while Valve is highly unorthodox, it's also highly successful, having released hit products like Half-Life, Portal, and the Steam distribution platform. It all makes you wonder, how does Valve maintain focus with such an open structure? How does a company this unpredictable decide what it wants to do next? And above all, what sort of people does it take to succeed in this type of environment? I'm here in Bellevue, Washington, with the hopes of finding a few answers to those questions. After avoiding a premature death by turret guns and a chandelier made of swords, I sit down with Robin Walker, a longtime veteran of the studio who worked on the original Team Fortress mod. These days, Robin's working on Dota 2, and his team plays a key role in the way Valve approaches the growing free-to-play business model. We felt we needed a lot of data. We needed to find out how customers would react to it. We wanted to find out you know, how much would, you know, we, we'd never shipped anything free, so we didn't know. Would people pay a lot of money for something they thought was really good if they could get it for free, or, or we didn't know. So that's, so instead we, we said, well, how do we answer these questions? We have this other product called Team Fortress. Let's see if we can use that to answer these questions. So a lot of, Amongst other things, some of the things that were, were uh, the, the things we did in TF2, a lot of them were driven by things we wanted to know and understand better so that we could uh, you know, be sure to make the right decision in our future products like Dota 2 or, or whatever else. Any mistakes that you made early on that taught uh, you some things and like the, the successes? Early on, we had sort of some mistaken assumptions about uh, the ways, the kinds of things customers would value that I think were carried over from watching the other, other free-to-play games out there. And once we sort of relaxed and said, no, let's stop trying to do what other people do and let's just see what our customers want us to do, uh, we managed to find things where it's pretty clear that uh, customers are very happy uh, and we're managing to make significant revenue. So, uh, yeah, I mean, the, the, this, it's been pretty straightforward, I guess. The things that have worked, we've, we've done what we've kept doing and we sort of let the others fall by the wayside. So as you guys go about defining your approach to free-to-play, taking those lessons that you learned from Te Team Fortress 2 and trying out new things with Dota 2, how much of that is influenced by Valve's uniquely flat corporate structure, the very peer-driven structure that you guys employ here? It's so sort of pervasive that it's hard to point to any particular thing. I mean, what you have is a, um, you know, we found that the free-to-play space uh, is extremely fertile and, and largely unexplored. Uh, we're, we're sort of mildly surprised by how much the industry seems to have already decided it's figured out the optimal strategy for free-to-play and microtransactions and so on. Uh, which means they must be all much smarter than us because every time we try something, we learn, you know, uh, what was what was bad about it and how we could do it better next time. And right. so, you know, we spent the last couple of years just constantly learning, uh, and probably have far more ideas today about what we should be doing, you know, next than we had at the start of this. So, the space is a really interesting one. It's a pure mix of business uh, and game design. Uh, uh, you know, and sort of a strong customer focus to it all. So, you know, I think many other organizations might carve those apart. You might have the business group sitting somewhere over there and they don't interact with the game design team, the game design team doesn't interact, or perhaps with the, the coding team and so on. And we find that uh, those things are so entwined here that uh, it's really useful uh, having the approach we have, which is, you know, all those, we take all those groups and we say it's everyone's responsibility to own all those things. You don't get to think about one of them and not have to think about the others. And so, uh, yeah, it's, it, I think it's um, working out well for us. Uh, I don't know, it's hard for me to know how we'd tackle it if we were organized any other way because we haven't ever been organized just, some other way. That's just how you operate. Yeah, There's exactly. There's no other option, really. Yeah.
The competitive strategy of Dota 2 is a far cry from Valve's first game, a little first-person shooter you may have heard of called Half-Life. Hey, Mr. Freeman. Back then, Valve was a much smaller studio, one that hadn't yet established its identity in the gaming world. Dario Casali has been here since those early days, and as a designer on the original Half-Life, he knows just how far Valve has come since the mid-1990s. Well, the first few years were, it was very much like, a, I think, a typical startup where yeah. um, we had folding picnic tables that we were working off. Um, not many of us had shipped the game before, so we were just kind of figuring out how that worked. Um, we didn't know each other, so we were getting to know each other. We got to know each other really well. Um, Everyone knew what everyone did, everyone knew everyone's name. I mean, there were 25, between 25 to 40 people maybe doing Half-Life 1. So back then in the early years, I would imagine you guys probably didn't make quite as much of Valve's sort of like flat structure back then, because then it just seems like a startup. Now it's unique for such a big company, but back then, was that something that even entered your mind? Um, having such a, a small number of people back then, we definitely multitasked. Um, and mostly we self-managed. Um, I think the hiring policy from the very beginning was experience-based. A lot of the people I was working with directly had come from the modding community already, so they'd kind of, they'd been pretty self-directed already, like they'd accomplished something outside of the company, so um, I think maybe that was the, the beginning of like the not, uh, lack of a need of hierarchy or structure. I think it was such a subtle evolution that um, kind of like a combination of good ideas over time yeah. rather than, hey, <laughs> Gabe pulled us into his office, he had this great idea, no one's going to have any managers, like it never really started. Right, that. I, I guess that's probably problem. a sign of why it's worked so well, is that it hasn't been a roadblock for you guys, it's just a natural yeah. thing that you never need to think about, you can just think about the games that you're making. Yeah, yeah, exactly, everybody is very responsible for their own career path within the company, but also the things that they're uh, contributing to the game. Um, yeah, we don't, I, I think even in the very beginning, I don't remember people yeah. like uh, giving work out and stuff like that. Yeah. It was very, uh, very organic that way. So as the years have mm -hmm. gone on, how do you think this structure has personally influenced your work uh, designing maps and levels for the, for the Half-Life series? Well, I think it's really nice to be able to choose which projects you're going to contribute to because um, we're all experts, experts on our own expertise, mm -hmm. and I think it's it's really encouraged for you to contribute to what you're going to be most valuable at. Right. I'm curious if you can describe the the process for ramping up a team as a project goes along. How you sort of like grab more and more people and add to the to the core that uh, originated. That's sort of what you guys call cabal. Is the term that you guys use for like the the, um, the team? That's usually the team that you end up with that has representative of multiple disciplines. Okay. Um, but building, getting to that point is pretty difficult sometimes. Um, you generally, it's essentially think of it as a labor market where you have to pull people from the market in to do, you know, to help working on this project. And people are only going to do that if they can see the potential and understand the project enough that they think they're going to be valuable for it because you're going to be pulling them off some other work probably. Um, and then you'll attract people if people think that it's a valuable project and if no one is interested in you kind of have to go back to the drawing board and say well based on the input from the people I actually tried to get involved um, how would I turn this into an interesting project uh, and then start again. <laughs> The only thing typical of Valve employees is that they tend to come from atypical backgrounds. That's especially true of Mike Moraski, a composer who's done music for Valve's more recent franchises like Portal and Left 4 Dead. Before coming to Valve, Moraski did everything from touring alongside Nirvana to producing visual effects in Hollywood blockbusters. Here at Valve, Moraski's resume isn't quite as unique as you might imagine. There was like eight of us that um, agreed to sit in a room with a bunch of students and kind of give them our backgrounds. And you know, everybody wants to know, how'd you end up here, right? Um, and so as we did it, we all kind of were looking at each other going, hey, me too, <laughs> right? Like that sort of a thing. Um, yeah, the, I think w what you see here a lot is multidiscipline, but also a real DIY sort of attitude. You know, people were like, oh, I didn't go to school for it. I just got a, I happened to have access to a computer and so I made my own video game or I made my own, you know, records mm -hmm. or I made my own whatever, comic books, what have you. 
Um, and that, that's probably the thing that I see the most here is, you know, sort of a, a little bit, you know, we hire more senior people yeah. for the most part. And in a lot of, a lot of those people come from an era where there was no way to go to school for it. Um, and, you know, even audio engineering would have been a tough, a tough thing to figure out how to go to school um, to study back then. And so there's a lot of that sort of, you know, self-made right. kind of people. Why is that such a valuable thing to have as you come to Valve and you begin working within this very uniquely flat organizational structure? Well, yeah, I mean, I guess the, the, the obvious thing is, well, I guess it's not that obvious to a lot of people. <laughs> um, and, it's, you know, I get asked a lot about the freedom here. Mm -hmm. um, and you know the, the standard expression is, is from freedom comes responsibility, right? Yeah. Here it works the other way around. Like before you can really exercise your freedom, you kind of have to show some responsibility and understand that you know if you try something and it fails, that's totally fine. But then it's sort of up to you to follow through and fix it, mm -hmm. right? And and uh, find the right path forward. As as a colleague said, you know here you're completely free to make the right decision, <laughs> right? And so a Valve system of people sort of like, you know, I guess the term is voting with their wheels, deciding which projects they want to work on by actually moving over and, you know, joining that team. Right. How does that work for you guys in the audio team, which is, you know, a little bit more of a specialized skill set. You've got, you have your own special studio up here on the top floor. Yeah, you know, that's, a, I think that's just a, that's a class, the, the isolation of audio artists is a, is a classic problem almost in any studio. Mm -hmm. um, we have desks in every cabal that are the audio desks that we can go sit at for play tests and you know for doing other types of implementation work. I actually spent my first year here um, in a corner with headphones just with everybody else uh -huh. uh, which was a valuable experience but you know, by the end it was sort of like okay I really actually need real speakers and <laughs> you know it's pretty fatiguing being in headphones all the time. Right. Audio I've found the one thing I've really learned here is that all the input we get, even though sometimes it's not valid or useful, mm -hmm. a lot of times it is. And so, you, you know, as an employee here, you really learn to take it all in, you know, kind of filter out the noise and, and go with the valuable things. And um, one of the things that it, it, I've seen work the best here is when people get really excited about something that somebody's doing that they might not otherwise stick with, right? Um, you know, a good example is, uh, the, some of the music in Portal 2, I was trying some weird experiments uh -huh. and you know one of the level designers was like, oh my god, do more, <laughs> more of that, you know, and I was like, I don't know, that's pretty weird, like, are you sure, you know, and um, so there, there's a lot of that sort of interaction, um, as well as of course, they're like, oh, I don't like that so much, we need to change it, right, um, but I, I don't know, this company, one of the most amazing things to me is, is the level of trust that we eventually find with each other mm -hmm. is you know when one of my colleagues will do some sound that I don't particularly like or thought was better before usually I just hold my tongue and wait and eventually he'll either come ask me what I think or change it you know <laughs> I usually don't have to put, put my two cents in yeah. right do you find that your professional background playing in bands uh, helps out here? Because in most bands, it's collaborative. There's no boss of a band. You're yeah. working together. I do, actually. In fact, I often refer to this place as like one of the best bands I've ever been in, <laughs> right? Because, um, you know, at the same time, it's that you, you're, you are looking at collaborating and kind of learning this language that sometimes you don't even have to speak, right? At the same time, we're people, right? Yeah. And without bosses, you know, things can get a little hot sometimes, <laughs> just like a band, right? Um, and and when it does, though, I think because we have that trust and we mm -hmm. we see what succeeds, we usually come to really s simple, quick resolutions to, to things, you know. And to further beat that metaphor into the ground, how do you avoid becoming a jam band? How do you make a product <laughs> that people actually want to experience? Well, you know, again, that, that actually harkens back to what we were just talking to previously, is that, you know, there's also a certain amount of responsibility, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's very rare that I'll get a finished piece of music and have to throw it away, mm -hmm. but it's because I've done all this upfront research and kind of testing along the way with my colleagues and, and play testers and, and whatnot and just looking at you know what the, the data is and, and again all getting all that input kind of boiling it down and then by the time you're sort of 
investing a lot of time in something, hopefully you've made the right choices, enough right choices along the way that you're not you know, going down a rabbit hole. It doesn't always work, but uh, <laughs> hopefully for the most part, that's, that's the case. Recently, Valve has grown into much more than just a company that makes video games. Besides growing into sort of a gatekeeper for PC gaming with Steam, Valve has recently become far more involved with creating the tools for its users to build and exchange their own creative ideas. You see that trend in things like Steam Workshop and Community Marketplace and Source Filmmaker. Eric Johnson does business development here at Valve, and he's deeply familiar with the steps the company is taking to become more than just a game developer. You know, kind of before the company's history even, there was a lot of people that understood the value of empowering developers. Um, in that if you could build tools that then a third party used, um, that, that those kinds of bets tended to pay off really well. Yeah. And so in some ways, you know, you look at uh, uh, Team Fortress um, and uh, Counter-Strike and Data Defeat and, and the, the old kind of mod community yeah. is one of those kind of pieces of data along the line where we found that we release, um, or in some cases, id released source code, right. and these developers went off and took those tools and built a bunch of interesting things out of them. Um, so that was user-generated content, you know, in 95 and 96 for the right. Team Fortress guys. It was very powerful. And then we kind of had the experience of Counter-Strike, where we found that as we continually released content to that community, the community kind of continued to grow. Mm -hmm. And the, looking back, I think that the interesting thing was that just the, in a multiplayer game, those users just playing the game, that's user-generated content also. It may be different on the value scale, but a person just playing a game with you online, they're generating value for you also. As the Team Fortress 2 team started kind of experimenting with how is it that we can connect users that are generating a bunch of value with people inside that community that want to consume it, right. that's what drove a lot of our thoughts. It's very similar to uh, why we built Steamworks. There's uh, a bunch of tools we can give to developers uh, and then they'll use those to generate a bunch of value. So we're always trying to kind of pair those groups together, if that oh. makes sense. Sure. And so that that's how today, you know, we think about things like there are professional players in Dota 2 that, mm. you know, thousands or hundreds of thousands of people spend their time watching. They're generating a bunch of value and we haven't figured out yet how to put those together, but those are kind of the things we think about now. And is that why Valve has gotten so big into economics over the past few years? Because oh, yeah. you guys are just jumping headfirst into that uh, free market uh, system of yeah, exchanging you, all these goods? Yeah, you end up um, pretty quickly dealing with uh, really traditional economic issues. I mean, you have to deal with inflation and um, do we need to have, you know, some uh, central authority type situation or what about trade tariffs? What about you know, trading across borders where maybe pricing is different. Many of these issues in some cases solve very poorly, <laughs> but they do get, they are things that come up for, um, you know, real world economies that uh, we could probably learn a lot from. I think Steam is probably one of the biggest turning points in the history of Valve as a company. Can you talk a little bit about what you guys were envisioning it would do when you ship the product versus what it's grown into now? The kind of the, the first uh, thoughts I think about around what Steam became were around Counter-Strike. Mm -hmm. And the thing that we saw was, so we, we shipped Half-Life uh, and it was a retail success. And then we shipped Team Fortress Classic as part of the SDK. And what we found was when we shipped Team Fortress Classic and the SDK and this mod community started building products, that we were selling more copies of Half-Life. And you know, part of it was like, hooray, we're selling more copies of Half-Life, but the data, the, the useful data, was that there's a, we have a connection with this community and we can sustain it over a long time. So we're like, well, let's just see exactly how far we can, can sustain it for. Our reaction was that we needed to have a way to have a long-term conversation with our customers. And so that, that is the fundamental kind of underpinning of what Steam is. We didn't, we weren't sitting around thinking, geez, we want to sell a bunch of games. Um, or, or anything like that. We just, we didn't want to have customers walk into a store, purchase a game, and then we never get to talk to them again because there's, uh, we think there's a bunch of value that we could have long term. So, 
So Steam had a, you know, a set of features. We wanted, we obviously needed to distribute products to people. Um, we wanted to have users connect to each other. Um, and we wanted to be able to kind of talk to our customers through our software over time as often as we needed to. The core idea of connecting content producers with, with fans is still the core thing that drives all of our decisions. We want the most efficient possible method for them to communicate in whatever way they want. So that, that kind of drives everything we do. So as you guys have um, built the studio, expanded into these different fields, how do you go about maintaining your identity of you know, an engineering-centric company that's sort of the origins there, and then you add in the, uh, the creative artistry of making games and telling stories, and then also add economics into that? How do you guys maintain an identity here? Well, it's, I mean, it just comes down to how you hire. Yeah. Uh, and hiring, hiring the kind of people that will be successful at Valve is the only real, we don't, we don't sit around and spend a bunch of time thinking about how to design the culture of Valve. Mm -hmm. um, we spend a huge amount of time sitting around deciding what are the kind, what are the qualities of the people that we think will be successful at Valve. Just, we've chosen a path for the type of company that's been designed and we're, we kind of have to stick with it. We think it's, really effective for what we do, mm -hmm. um, but it's not broadly applicable across all things. So senior people that are very motivated, uh, not a lot of ego, <laughs> um, and that want to build products for customers are, are kind of the, the key components. Generally, you know, at their craft, people tend to be, we hope, you know, we're hiring the best in the world. That's kind of what our goal is. So. The right man in the wrong place can make all the difference in the world. No matter where Valve is heading in the future, it's already cemented its place as one of the most fascinating companies in the video game industry. Its success is hard to explain, but it's clear that the studio's unique culture and dedication to hiring employees from diverse backgrounds has played a key part in that success. Wherever Valve is going, one thing's for certain, it'll be an interesting journey to watch. Or I'll take a give a wrench. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no.